I'm going to teach you how to easily make product animations in Blender. If you want to learn more about the tools and techniques that you see me using in these videos, then check out my new Blender ebook, the link is below. I already have a model that I'm going to use in this video. We made this in the last tutorial. So if you want to see how I model and texture this, then go check that video out. If you want to download the models that I make in my videos, check out my Patreon page. You'll find them over there. Otherwise, you got to make your own. So first of all, I need to explain to you how animation works in Blender. This is the basic shit. If you already know this, just skip this part. In your default Blender scene, you're going to have this window at the bottom called the timeline. If you don't have this, you can just right click on the side, horizontal split, and then use this little menu over here to switch from 3D viewport to timeline. Line. This is the same as when you're watching my YouTube video and it tells you how far you are through the video. So right now we're frozen in time and if we play this then we're playing our animation. We haven't animated anything yet so nothing's gonna happen but here's how you animate things. We're going to have to create some keyframes which are basically just different points in time which indicate that something is happening at this particular moment. For example at the beginning of our scene I want our cube to start over here and then I want it to move up here after one second. So first I have to indicate that in the beginning the cube has to be over here which I'm going to do by placing this marker on the first frame and pressing I then in the insert keyframe menu I'm going to click on location now blender knows that at this point in time this has to be the location of the cube then we're going to move the time marker onto frame 24 because currently our frame rate is 24 frames per second which means 24 is exactly one second and at frame 24 I want my cube to be up here so with my marker on frame 24 with my cube moved up here I'm once again going to press I keyframe location now if I go back to keyframe zero and I play my animation with space the cube just moves up. You can move these keyframes to different time the same way that you move stuff through your scene in Blender. You can select these with right click and shift right click. You can even use your box select tool and with G you can just move this to a different point in time. Now if you move this to like frame 40, nothing is going to happen until frame 40 and then at frame 40 Blender knows that we have to move from the starting position into the upper position. You can also move these keyframes further apart to slow down the animation because now it takes more frames for this to happen. Notice how currently this cube kind of accelerates and then it's slows down when it gets to the top. So it's a very smooth movement. To change this, you can select the keyframes, press T and change the interpolation to linear. Now there's not going to be an acceleration. It's just going to move at a constant rate. Of course, you can animate more than just your location. You can animate almost any attribute in Blender like the rotation, scale, color, emission, anything. You can even animate properties in your modifiers, but we're trying to keep it simple in this video. So we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about these finer animation features in the new ebook update. So from this point in time until the ebook update, let's do a 20% discount. The good thing is that when you're making product animations in Blender, you usually just have to use the very basic animation features in Blender. You don't have to know all this next level shit that you see them use in Marvel movies. But if we want to make this cube rotate or even change in size before it comes up here, we're first going to set a keyframe down here for location, rotation, and scale. Now Blender remembers the specific location, rotation, and scale that the cube has at this moment, which means if we place our marker on the second keyframe, we can then change the rotation and change the scale. Then again, we're going to keyframe location, rotation, scale, now Blender registers a difference between these two points. So when we play our animation, these properties are going to change. Again, you can change the interpolation to linear and then there's not going to be this smooth transition. You can also duplicate keyframes so we can take the first keyframe and place it behind the second keyframe. And then the animation is going to jump back and forth between these points. That's the most basic shit that you need to know for now. Let me show you how you can make a simple animation with this iPhone. First of all, we have to imagine what we're trying to animate. If you need some inspiration for what kind of animations to create, find a product on Amazon which has an animation. Then over here, you can find some cool shots of what the other guy did. And you can try to replicate some of this stuff with your own model in Blender. You better believe this guy's getting paid good money for this shit. So whatever he's doing, he's doing something right. But let me just show you a very simple animation that I made just to demonstrate how this shit works to you guys. And then you can go crazy. And if you make something cool with this technique, then send it to me on Discord. So I'm going to take this phone right here and I'm going to flip it sideways by rotating it by 90 degrees on the y-axis. Then I'm going to duplicate it, right-click to snap it back into place, and then rotate it by 180 degrees on the y-axis. I'm going to place these phones so they're facing each other. And now I want to make an animation where they're kind of moving sideways like this. But as they're moving, they're going to sort of rotate like this. And then you're going to be able to see the face of the phone and the backside of the phone a little bit better. So to do this, I'm going to select both of these phones. On frame zero, I'm going to keyframe location and rotation. Then I'm going to jump to like frame 50 or something. And remember, we can always change the position of this new keyframe that we're about to create so we can slow down or speed up the animation. Then I'm going to move them a little bit further down the y-axis. and. 
with I, I'm once again going to keyframe location and rotation. Now these phones just kind of shift from point A to point B. And we're going to throw this a little bit further down the timeline to slow this down. I also don't want this animation to be smooth. So I'm going to select the keyframes, press T, change the interpolation to linear. Now the locations are just changing at a constant rate. So now we're going to come down here to frame 90 where the second keyframe is located. We're going to switch the pivot point to individual origins. And then we're going to rotate both of the phones around their individual origin points like this. We're going to try to rotate them as much as possible, but not so much that they get some collisions between them. Once we do that, we're once again going to keyframe location and rotation. And now as we travel through time, these phones are also going to rotate. So this is what our animation looks like so far. If you look at any animation online, you're going to notice that it has multiple shots and each shot is like two or three seconds long. So don't focus too much on one animation. Try to make a bunch of shots and then when you put them together, it's going to look way cooler than just one single animation. Now we have to figure out what to do with our camera. First of all, we have to think about what we're going to do. I want my camera to focus on this part over here, and I want it to slowly rotate around this area, but only slightly. And we're also going to make it follow the phones as they're moving, but we don't want the camera to move at the same speed as the phones, because then the movement of the phones is not going to be visible. So since we're trying to focus on this point, let's place a three cursor between these two phones, go to shift A, add a new empty, and we're going to add the arrows. Then move these arrows to place them approximately around the point at which you want the camera to focus. So for me, that's going to be around here somewhere but it doesn't matter too much we can easily change this if you don't have a camera in your scene go to shift a and add a new camera and then press ctrl alt and zero on the number pad to align the camera with your view it's very important that you now set the resolution of your camera because this makes your animation look totally different and it completely depends on what you're trying to make the animation for for example if you're trying to make an animation for an instagram story you can't have this landscape shot it's going to look like shit but if you're trying to make it for amazon then you're obviously going to need this type of resolution i like to just make vertical renders if you're making this for amazon or something you just keep the default resolution 1920 by 1080 you can even double this if you got the gpu that can render this in less than 11 days but i'm going to use a lower resolution just to demonstrate how this works in this video for you guys and then you can go ahead and fuck around and do this for three days if you feel like so i'm going to set my resolution to 512 by 900 because that makes it pretty easy for me to showcase this in the intro of the video but obviously you can do whatever you want now with shift s i'll snap my 3d cursor to this empty object that we place right here and then i'll select the camera and with shift s i'll snap the camera to the 3d cursor now the camera is placed on this object Object, which means it is exactly at this location. It is looking directly at the center of this empty object. So now enter camera view by pressing zero on the number pad, press G and then press Z twice to move the camera back and forth. And we're going to zoom out a little bit like this. I used the wrong word because we didn't zoom out. We just moved the camera away. We're now going to zoom out by changing the focal length. So select the camera, go to camera properties over here and increase the focal length because a higher focal length always makes animations look way cooler in this type of situation. If you use a very low focal length, then it just looks like Minecraft Quake Pro and it looks stupid. When you increase the focal length, you might have to move your camera even further away. And if your 3D cursor is the pivot point, you can very easily rotate your camera around the 3D cursor. Just make sure that your 3D cursor is placed on this empty object. You can also press R to rotate and then double X to kind of move the camera up and down. Rotating this around the global X axis is not going to do because it's going to look kind of shitty. Now select the camera and shift select the empty object. Press Control P, object keep transform. And now our camera is parented to this object. So everywhere that we move this object, the camera is going to follow. The reason the reason that we're doing this is because it's much easier to animate rotation on the camera. If you just animate rotation on the camera without using a parent object, then the camera is not going to stay focused on this point around which you pivoted the animation. It's just going to look for the quickest way to get from point A to point B. It's not necessarily going to follow a certain path. That's why we're parenting the camera to the empty object and we're going to animate the empty object so the camera always stays focused on that. So first of all, we need to animate some movement on the empty object. So we're going to keyframe that right here first. Then a little bit further down the timeline, we're going to move this empty object somewhere over here. I keyframe location, rotation, scale or whatever. We're also going to make the interpolation linear. And now your camera is also following this scene. You can now adjust how far you want this to go and you can rearrange the keyframes to make it faster or slower. This is totally up to you. But on the last keyframe, we're also going to rotate this empty object. So I'm going to only slightly rotate it like this. I to keyframe location rotation. And now as the camera follows this phone, it's also rotating around the Z axis slightly. I'm going to have to trim my animation because I don't want this last part to be visible. I'm going to set the end to something like 80 frames. Or if you want to be very precise, since we're using 24 frames per second, we can set this to multiple of 24, such as 24 times four. And this is going to give us exactly four seconds. If you want to be extra, you can change the frame rate of the animation. Go over here to output settings on the side of the screen and set the frame rate to whatever you want. If you set this to 60, 
60, then more frames are going to fit into one second, which means your animation is now going to be more than twice as fast. So keep that in mind if you're changing the frame rate. Something like 30 usually gives you a good balance because you get a pretty smooth and nice animation, but you don't have to spend nine days sitting here animating 6 million frames. So let's say this is what our animation is supposed to look like, and now we have to figure out how we're going to light this scene. First of all, I always like to use an HDRI because it makes your lighting that much better. To add an HDRI, go to your shading workspace, switch from object to world, and now you can control your nodes for your world texture. By default, you're just going to have this background color, which by the way, you can also change to anything you want. And in your render preview, you're going to see a color and it's also going to cast a different color of light onto your scene. Now, the same way that you can replace your base color with an image and your materials for an object, you can also replace the background color with an image for the world. So to do that, you first need to find an image which you're going to place around the world. This is totally up to you, whatever you think would look cool. I usually go for some kind of studio environment which has both artificial lighting and natural lighting coming from the windows. Make sure to pay attention to these little 3D objects that they place in front of this HDRI because that's going to show you what the reflections look like and more importantly, it's going to show you what the shadows look like. So once you chose an HDRI, just click on this big button to download it. And then in your downloads folder, you're going to find an HDR file. Sometimes it's going to be an EXR file. Now to apply this note to your background, you first need to add an environment texture node place that right here next to the background open up the HDRI which you just downloaded plug color into color and now you're gonna see this shit in the background of your scene I usually go to render properties film and I check this transparent box that makes the background invisible in your renders but the light is still being cast onto the scene from the environment I'm currently using Eevee just to give you guys a simple preview of what I'm talking about but Eevee looks like shit so when we do the real thing we're gonna switch to cycle you might want to change the position of the HDRI because you might not be happy with your main light source coming from the this direction you might want it coming from the other direction so let's go to edit preferences add-ons type in node and you're going to find this add-on called node wrangler check that fucking add-on close the blender preferences select your environment texture node and press ctrl t now you added a couple of nodes which you can use to rotate the world you're usually just going to need the z-axis rotation so you can slide this back and forth to place this differently it's totally up to you what you want to do you're going to get a better idea of what this looks like once you get a first rendered shot but for now just keep in mind that you are going to be able to change this now let's talk about the artificial lighting sources. The purpose of the HDRI was mainly just to give us a kind of realistic environment for the object. The purpose is just to give us some realistic reflections that you can see on the object, which is going to make it look like it's actually in the real world. You don't have to do this. Some animations don't have this. I just like to do this so you can just skip the whole HDRI part if you want. But if you look at this object right now, it's got some reflections. It's reflecting my computer monitor. It's reflecting my face. But the main light source is this lamp that I have in front of me right here. If I turn off this lamp, it still looks realistic, but it looks like shit because there's no strong light cast onto it. So the artificial lighting in Blender is like me turning on this lamp right next to me. There's many different types of lights that you can use in Blender. We're not going to talk about every single light in this video, but guess where I'm going to break down these lights for you guys if you're interested. The best way to light a scene in my opinion is to create a plane, switch to cycles render, add a new material to that plane, set the emission color to white, and you can just crank up the emission. Now we just have a glowing object which is adding some light into our scene. The reason that I like using a plane instead of an area light is because you can reshape the plane to whatever you want. It's also very easy to kind of tile it and you can use an array modifier on it as well. And that's going to give you studio lighting or you can shape the light to whatever you want and you can have very good control over what your reflections look like on the object. You can see in my scene, I got all these different lights around here that I made earlier. I even made these cool little shapes so I can control the reflections off the camera when I was doing another animation. But I'm going to get rid of all these for now because I don't really need them. So first we have to take a look at what our lighting situation looks like at the moment. To do that, you can just go up here to render preview and then Blender is going to render the light lights in your 3d viewport but anyway first of all i noticed that my hdri is way too powerful so in my world shader settings i'm going to reduce the power of the hdri to something like 0.3 now the scene is darker and it's more dependent on the artificial lighting that we're about to create it's totally up to personal preference i usually go for something around half just so we have some reflection from the world but i don't want this to be the most significant source of light in the scene then i'm going to take this plane and i'm going to make it shorter on the y-axis i'm going to add an array modifier set the relative offset to like two on the y-axis now we can crank this up and we have multiple light sources above the phone right now. You're also going to have to experiment a little bit with different rotation on the HDRI, different placements of the light. Your light might be way too strong or way too weak. I usually think it's pretty cool if you make the light source slightly bluish. It makes it look a little bit more natural. Maybe you have to reduce the number of lights you have. Maybe you have to place them at a totally different location. Maybe you need to have multiple light sources and maybe your light sources need to have multiple colors. And this is the type of shit that I can't really teach you because it's entirely dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. So there isn't really a rule which 
which is always going to work. You just have to kind of try some shit until it kind of works. It's just the same as 3D modeling. It's just the same as looking for clients. It's just the same as picking up bitches. It's just the same as doing anything in life. I can point you in the right direction by showing you the tools and showing you how I do this. And then you can try to tweak this a little bit and adjust it to your own particular purpose. Now I showed you the little lighting tricks and the camera animation tricks. I'm just going to make some more adjustments to this scene. For example, I place my camera above the scene like this. I think that gives me a much cooler shot. I'm also going to move the camera a little bit further away. And then off camera, I'm probably going to spend about 10 minutes figuring out what's the best way to place these lights. And eventually I figure out that it looks pretty cool if we can see some reflections of the artificial light in the backside of the phone right here. I can move these lights around on the local X and Y axes. If I'm in camera view, this is pretty helpful for trying what and how they affect the reflections on the phone. You can also control your reflections by placing random objects without a glow into the scene. For example, these lights that I created over here, even if they don't have any emission, that they're still visible as a reflection on the phone. So keep this in mind because right now this phone is very glossy. And if we have a very dark reflection on this side of the phone, we might want to place a white plane somewhere on the side over there just to lighten up this reflection a little bit, even though we don't want any light from that direction. But anyway, now we're beating a dead horse. You understand how lighting works. Try fucking around with this a little bit and try to figure out what works best in your situation. Keep in mind that we are going to be able to post process this animation. So you can change the colors, you can change the contrast, you can make a big difference on what the video is finally going to look like. Let's talk about rendering. Once our animation, our lights, our environments, and all this other shit is ready, we're gonna have to export this animation as a video. Normally, you can render your shit in Blender by pressing F12, but that's just going to give you an image. So instead of just an image, we want to export this entire timeline. The unfortunate news is that you are indeed going to have to render 80 separate images in this case. If you have a longer animations, you might have to render 800 frames. This is why animation is such a pain in the ass in Blender. And this is why I'm only showcasing very simple short animation for this video. And I'm letting you know, if you wanna do longer animations, good luck. But now we're going to adjust the render properties and the export properties. So in the render properties, obviously you have to be in cycles. You have to set the number of samples that you want for your render. This is basically the amount of times the Blender recalculates the reflections of the light to give you a very accurate and sharp result. The higher the number of samples you have, the nicer and sharper your final image is going to look. For example, if you only have four samples, Blender is going to produce a very grainy image like you can see right here. You can check your denoise, and this is going to remove the noise, but it's still going to be kind of blurry, especially on the detail areas. And this is going to be kind of flickering in the animation if you have a very low sample rate. So you're going to have to crank that shit up. In my simple previews, usually 128 does it for me because it looks good enough for a video introduction. But if you're doing this professionally, you're going to want to go to at least 256, maybe even more than that. Keep in mind that when I'm rendering this at 128 samples, usually it takes around one minute per frame more or less. So if you're rendering at 256, it's going to take a lot more than that. I don't know how much more. It depends on your GPU. It might take you seven minutes to render one frame. So when you're rendering this, you're going to want to let that cook overnight and I hope you're not sleeping in the same room as your computer because it's going to sound like an airplane is taken off. So we got our samples, we got our denoise, make sure that's checked. Set the rendering device to your GPU because probably it's faster than your CPU, but if you have a shit GPU, you might want to render with your CPU. Now we're going to go to the output properties and this is where you control the file properties. For example, this is your resolution, this is your aspect ratio, this is your frame rate, this is how long the animation is going to be and all this other shit. This is where we have to tell Blender that we want to render animation. By default, the file format is going to be PS and you can switch this between RGB and RGBA. If you switch to RGBA, you add an alpha channel to the image. So if you render an image, it's going to have a transparent background. Then you can go to image, save as. You can save that as an RGB PNG and you're going to have an image which you can place on top of another image. If you want to render a video, in the file format, switch to FFmpeg video. In the encoding, I switch the container to MPEG4. Video codec is H.264, that's MP4. Output quality is up to you. The higher you go, obviously the nicer it's going to look. And guess what? It's going to take a longer time to render. I usually render it high quality and it works pretty well for me. The encoding speed controls how quickly Blender is going to encode this shit. If you go for a slower encoding speed, it's going to take a longer time to render again. I usually go for good. We don't have any audio, so it doesn't matter. And now you just have to choose your output folder. You can name this to whatever you want. I'm going to name mine render slide and click accept. Before you start rendering, it might be a good idea to check what your image is going to look like on different keyframes. So for example, I'm first going to check what the lighting looks like on keyframe 12. I can see that this part of the animation is kind of dim, so I might have to add some more lighting for this part. Then I'm going to check somewhere in the middle and I'm also going to check at the end. Once you made your final adjustments, make sure to save the file, then go to render and click on render animation. And now you're probably gonna have to spend the next afternoon rendering this. So make sure you plan this, make sure you do this at a time when you don't need your computer, such as before 
you go to bed. And you never really know. Maybe when you render this, it's gonna look pretty shitty. Maybe you're gonna find out you have to use twice as many samples. Maybe you find out that you need totally different lighting. If you wanna make sure that nothing goes wrong over the next eight hours, this is your best bet because you can't make sure. If you learned something from this tutorial, then at least like the video. It doesn't cost you anything to subscribe to the channel either. But check out the fucking ebook too because I'm gonna add a bunch of stuff in there soon. Let me know what you wanna see next and I'll see you guys in the next one.